Welcome back to the What's Your One More podcast. I'm your host, Quentin Harris, and here we are for episode 144. Now, I got to tell you, as I do this episode, we're going to break down the State of the Union address, some things that we saw in there, some things that we wanted to hear that we didn't hear, as well as the job reports that correlated that came out the day after the State of the Union address. Now, I want to preface with this. This is a sensitive topic because for me, this is not a political bash. That's not what this is. Again, it, right and wrong doesn't, doesn't determine if it's Democrat, Republican. It, it's the facts. So that's what I'm going to gauge here on this episode are some facts. And, you know, if you watch the State of the Union address, for me, I felt like I was watching a little bit of a pep rally combined with maybe, um, you know, someone that's running for class presidents that's in middle school. And, you know, and, and I say it with that, not any disrespect to the current administration, but you know what I'm talking about. Like when you were in middle school, you had a class president would stand up and talk about, hey, listen, we're going to have better lunches. We're going to get out of school earlier. You know, and if you're in high school, you get Fridays off. You don't have to come to school because that's what you wanted. The, that's what you wanted the, the audience or constituents in this case. You wanted them to, to, to believe you could do that, right? You, that's where you wanted to be. And this year's State of the Union address was no different. And matter of fact, you know, I was talking to my mother-in-law about this the other night at dinner. She said the same thing. She goes, well, isn't every State of the Union like that? Yeah. Pat, you're correct. Absolutely, it is. It doesn't matter, again, if it's if it's Trump, if it's Biden, if it was Reagan, if it was Clinton, Obama. It doesn't matter. Bush doesn't matter. It's always to tell you what you want to try to do versus what you can do because you need cooperation and bipartisanship to get it done. But there were some things in the State of the Union that I think were you know worth noting and worth going through, and uh, some good and bad, right? And so for me, what was interesting is that, you know, uh, the, the administration and the president jumped off talking about the battle of Ukraine and what's going on overseas and, 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 and what's being done to prevent what could happen, right? Uh, they, put, they put Putin in this category of, you know, uh, terroristic person that could harm the U.S. and do a tremendous amount of danger. And, and while I'm not denying that, one of the things I was hoping we would hear on the backside of that was what's going on in our own country, you know, what are we doing to fund issues in our own country? Because, you know, it wasn't two weeks ago, Congress just gave $90 billion to aid Ukraine in the war. Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but where's some of the stuff to help our own country here and things? We have our own issues here. Let's not deny that. And they need some attention. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We also didn't hear anything on the counter of that about the national debt. I was really hoping to hear, you know, obviously, what we've done like in so many episodes on the national debt here and the, the looming issues that are happening there. I mean, some people even call this thing a fiscal time bomb because it is it is an issue that's continuing to happen, and we need to address it. And I was really hoping to get something from that, not one blurb. Not one bird about the stock market either. Nothing. And so all the, the financial sector side of things was completely avoided in that speech, which was kind of odd. I really thought we would hear something about that. And going back to this, this fiscal time bomb, if you may, for the national debt, the thing that I was really hoping to hear about was what are we going to do to change it? What are we going to do to alter it? Um, you know, we did hear some things about taxing, you know, millionaires and billionaires. And, and while I think that needs to be done, let's not get it twisted. The amount of tax that that they referred that they would put on to billionaires and millionaires, it doesn't scrape the deficit by maybe 5%. And I'm not making it up, but that's the Congressional Budget Office that did that. The CBO conducted that study and showed that it wouldn't make that big a difference. It didn't make a very tiny difference, but it takes something more substantial or maybe something in combination with that to make an impact. The biggest thing that could happen is stop spending all the excessive money over the current budget, and that's going to help. Or you create more budget by ultimately raising taxes across the board, which, by the way, I'm not saying do. No one's a fan of that, but that's the only way you're going to do it, not just raising one sector of the taxes. And so that was something I was hoping to hear about. And, you know, and let's not forget, it wasn't just last week, I believe it was maybe 10 days ago, that all of a sudden the interest payment, I was hoping to hear about this, the interest payment that we're making on the national debt, that is actually greater now than the money we spend on the Department of Defense. It's greater than the Department of Defense budget. And, like, to me, that that's an issue we need to talk about, right? Because, as you know, if we're, if we're going to talk about Putin and we're going to talk about other issues across the country being, you know, potential uh, – worrisome issues, then we need to talk about how to defend that. And we need to talk about budgeting for that. And none of that was discussed. Um, I thought that was an opportunity missed. And I thought that was something that I think a lot of people in the country wanted to hear, hear about, um, you know, and I think the one thing he did mention about national debt, then he did, he talked about how this administration reduced the national debt. Now, I'll tell you this, they spent less than the Trump administration. There's no doubt about it. Now, you could argue that was COVID driven by the Trump administration. You could argue it was it was incorrect spending. Whatever, that's a fact. They did spend less. But let's not get it twisted. The national debt has only gone up since Clinton left office. So it doesn't matter what side of the table you're on. It continues to go up. So, yes, you spent less than your predecessor, but it did not. It, you haven't reduced it. You just reduced what the previous person spent. And, and anytime you're going into election year, this was a little bit of um, opportunities to take shots at, at 
at maybe your 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 opposition and maybe your predecessor. And, you know, Biden did a good job of that. And it's exactly what he meant to do. And I mean, at the, at the end of the day, um, he has spent less than the Trump administration, but it's still going up. It's not getting better. So it's not like it's a win in that category. He also took credit for a lot of creation of jobs. I'm going to spend a significant amount of time talking about that because, you know, there's two types of jobs reports, right? We've got the ADP, which that's the private sector job reports. And then you got the BLS, which is the government sector. So when you're looking at the private sector, ADP, we all know is one of the largest, if not the largest payroll company. If ADP is giving me numbers and it's from the private sector and they have data real time from the private sector, I think those numbers are going to be a little bit more accurate. You could also argue there'll be higher paying jobs and better for the economy on that side of the table. Then you get the BLS, which is the government's reporting, and that is done through a household survey. So it's a little dated, like a lot of the ways the government has done their surveying and through the CPI and the, and the PCE. There's no different on the BLS, I think. There's some surveys and components that take place of that that kind of yield the numbers that are coming out. And so what we're finding is that the ADP numbers are coming in reflecting job losses. They're reflecting they're coming in less creations than expected. And then on the BLS side, we have headlines that are actually coming in showing this exuberant amount of growth on the headline. Now, that's important because we've talked about this in multiple episodes. These headlines come out, and then you get a revision along with the headline. Now, the revisions for the previous month that says, hey, listen, we created a bunch of jobs, and then we're going to revise it either up or down. Well, for nine months in a row now, it's been revised down, and not just by a little bit. It's significant. So we got a February headline that shows, hey, listen— greater than expected, but the January revision came back with a lot less revised. As a matter of fact, the revision, and I'm working from my iPhone, I left my laptop at home today, but the uh, the revisions that came in were a hundred, so, so you come in with a revision on this and, and pull it up here again, work from an iPhone, much different than working from a laptop. But the revision on this showed that there was a negative 184,000 revision done. That means they took the number and they subtracted 184,000 jobs from that number. That's a massive revision. I'm not saying it's the largest revision, but I'm saying it's a really, really big revision saying that you missed the mark by 184,000. I believe the number that was reported was like 385, but then you revise it at 184, that means 201. That means you were actually less, way less than expectation on that. And so how can you be off in 30 days 184,000 jobs? That's, that's a question we keep asking ourselves around here all the time. I mean, again, I said this in a previous episode, it's like getting an A on a paper, you're so excited. You go home and show your parents, like, hey, listen, I got an A. I'm crushing it. And they're so excited for you. And then a week later, you get a D on that same paper because it was revised down to a D. That's not that, that's not a good way of, of doing things. And that's kind of what this job reports. But the creation is something that is kind of being touted is that you're creating more jobs, but you're constantly revi- revising the creation of those jobs. And, you know, and, and it, it's not, I guess this was on the backbone of this healthy economy that we got going. And I think a lot of Americans are waking up to the fact that this is not a healthy economy. I mean, and and we can honestly say that because unemployment went up. I mean, literally right after the union, the next day, the unemployment number goes up from 3.7 to 3.9. Why that doesn't sound like a significant growth number, it, it is. And more importantly, wage growth that went down as well. And so there were some things on here that didn't improve and have kind of are showing the data starting to show up. And it's something that Daniel Halverson and myself have been talking about on this in the lending update quite a bit is that when these job numbers start to make the turn, that's when we're going to see some of the federal reserve pressure take place and go from restrictive to less restrictive to maybe even interest rate cuts. And I'll stand behind the fact that I think that this next meeting, this coming out of this next meeting, there's still a very slim chance, but definitely the following meeting, you're going to get that cut before June. Um, as a lot of, uh, pundits think it's still standing in a June, uh, opportunity on there. So Here was something else inside this speech that I thought was interesting. And this is something that, again, I'm not a fan of this particular thing. I think government regulation in the private sector is not a great um, place because I think anytime regulation comes in, it hinders growth. And I'm not talking about like monopolies. I'm just talking about getting into companies' business, telling companies what they can and can't do, what they can and can't charge always hurts the customer at the end of the day. You know, when I got in the lending business in 2002, the game changed in 2010 when the CFPB was created. And when the CFPB was created, they changed the way that loan officers were paid and went from a per deal to a volume component based on, you know, the the, the loan size, not necessarily the amount of income generated on that loan. And at the end of the day, what's happened there is that the cost per loan have become more expensive and they continue to become more expensive. And that's all passed down to the consumer and it's absorbed in different ways by the consumer. And it might not be directly in the loan. I mean, it could be in the fact that you don't really have a free checking account anymore. I mean, think about that. 
free checking accounts used to be a thing that you got everywhere you went. And now you don't even get that. You get a limited amount of time uh, to, to even go to the window to go inside of a bank. They may let you come in like two or three times. And then prior to that, you don't have to come in anymore. You don't even get free checks anymore. Like, I mean, this is stuff that was so basic back then, but now those things are taken away from you because, well, there's been other regulation put in there that has costs that's, or things that you can't do, so they're passing it down a different way. This always happens like that. And at the forefront of it is is government regulation. It always happens that way. And it's, while, again, might not, I'm definitely not going to gain some fans on that one, but again, I'm not saying this is a Joe Biden thing. That's not what I'm saying. It's a government thing. It just happens to be right now, and it's government regulation. So, And then, you know, you can also argue, well, hell, you know, Trump's tax cuts didn't help. Yeah, I'll give you that one. They probably didn't help the deficit, but they weren't the reason for the deficit. And, you know, and I continue to see those on comments online. Believe it or not, we do read all the YouTube comments you put on there and all the comments you put on our socials. And, and some of them are really well articulated. And the feedback has been great as I continue to tell people online, thank you for your feedback. Appreciate it. Um, but it's not all. It wasn't. I mean, it seems like, it was, you know, we're, we're so divided right now. It's either, oh, you're so pro Trump or you're so pro Biden. And it's, it's not that's not what it is. Right now, I'm. I'm pro uh, healthy economy. That's what I'm pro. And we need to get back to that because we get back to that. A lot of this um, uh, issues, the financial issues that we're seeing are going to get better than what they are right now. You know, we just got a consumer spending um, data released last Friday. Inside that consumer spending, we were expected to see $9 billion in consumer. That was the expectation, $9 billion for the month of January consumer spending, $9 billion. Now, remember, January is after December, so we shouldn't see that much spending in January came in at $19 billion, $10 billion higher than expectations. And that's because it's not because people are going buying lavish items. It's the cost of living has become so accelerated that people are continuing to finance their cost of living at the grocery store, their cost of living just through electrical bills. I mean, it's the standard way of living. They're not going out and buying extra things. And, you know, Top that off with what we just talked about on the insurance episode with rates that are going up. I mean, everything is being raised, and we got to get that under control. That stuff has to get under control to where it becomes more of a healthy economy, not more government regulation, not 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 just taxing the the ultra wealthy. Hell, everybody's going to have to be taxed at some component. That's what's going to happen um, for that to get better as far as the national debt is concerned. But you know, he talked about some um, some things that were going to get better. Housing credits, right? Hey, hats off, man. I think that's great. Housing credit. He talked about the removal of title insurance on refinances. Um, yeah, I can see how all that's a huge benefit. And, and, and if that helps lower the cost for the everyday person to get a refinance cheaper, and I know some states title insurance is lesser than others and more than others in some states, that's, fin- that's fantastic. That's great. And he can do that on an agency level because the FHFA controls Fannie and Freddie. He can say, yeah, we're going to do that. And that's a win. But, you know, Giving more money for student, more money back for student loans and for students, I mean, where's that money coming from, right? That money's coming from somewhere. That's more government spending. And in the housing credits, you know, that you're going to get on your tax returns, that still is government spending, you know, and, and you still are paying for that some way, which means all of us are paying for it some way. We may be getting a tax credit, but we're all paying for that in some way. So um, I do like the idea of the title insurance. I thought hats off to, to President Biden for that and getting the removal of that. I think that's a big win on refinances. It'll also speed up the process. Um, and, you know, and I, again, the trade-off is could more title fees be put on the purchases of loan because you're stepping in and regulating and removing something on one side that title companies are used to making money on, and now where are they going to put it? Probably back on the purchase side. That's usually how that stuff works. And so just because you're eliminating a potential feature doesn't mean that the cost structure has gotten any better. And that's something that I think gets missed in, in a lot of the, the rah-rah that goes around here, um, you know, on these on these speeches here. And, you know, maybe it's me, but I mean, I, I you know, I've probably seen seven or eight state of the unions with different presidents. And I don't thought I'd ever seen one that was so, um, I don't like the word theatrical, but very divided. Um, you know, obviously sometimes you get like the mute clap, you get the huge, you know, roaring from one side. Um, but I, I, I don't remember a time in which the heckling was so bad on both sides during a state of the union address that, you know, another thing is this again, doesn't matter what side of the table you're on. You got to give credit where credit is. The fact that that man could stand at a podium and keep his poise and composure and not miss a beat. Yeah. I mean, if you've done any public speaking to have someone heckle you in a crowd like that and still maintain that level of cadence and not lose track of thought and continue to deliver, you know, hats off on that one, man. I'll tell you what, cause I know that wasn't easy. I was expecting that to turn into something a little bit more and, you know, stayed right on track, got done. And uh, while I didn't agree with some of the stuff he said, I did like the way that he was able to maintain his focus and get that done. 
Um, so, you know, I, I, the other thing about this, that I'll get to, and I'll kind of wrap this up here. At some point, I wish Powell, when he goes to Congress, switching gears from State of the Union to, to Powell's congressional testimony, I wish when he went to Congress that he would literally look at them in the eye and say, hey, listen, the only way we're going to keep inflation down, right, is we got to quit cycling more money into the economy. That means we got to quit this deficit spending. We got to keep stop printing money, essentially. And uh, quite frankly, here's how you're going to do it. And he has he has the knowledge. He knows what it's going to take. He's too scared to go up there and say it. He's supposed to be an independent of Fed. He's supposed to be independently from the federal government. And they're not. And because of that, we're going to continue to fight this inflationary issue right now because he should be telling them what they're doing wrong. And he's not doing that. Instead, he's literally just saying, well, it's, it's really none of my business. Well, that, that is absolutely wrong. It's absolutely part of your business. It's absolutely what you should be saying. But I'll go back to this comment. Who appointed Powell? Well, that was Trump. Who's been more critical of Powell since he's been appointed? Trump or Biden? It's absolutely been Trump. And if you're Powell and you want to maintain your job, you're going to do what it takes to appease the person in office so that you can keep that position. So that is another reason why I think you're going to see the rate cuts coming. That's another reason why I think the economy is going to have to look better before November. It's going to have to look better for the incumbent before November. And the quickest way to do that is to get some relief from the Federal Reserve and the Fed funds rate in the form of the Fed funds rate to help stimulate sectors of the economy. And I do believe that's coming, and I believe it's coming quicker than expected. And I think it's something that we're going to see before the June Fed Open Market Committee meeting. So guys, if you like what you're hearing, check out our YouTube channels. I want to put some graphs in there that I normally don't put in there for my friends over MBS Highway, but it's so good. Like I, I got to give credit to Barry and the team over there. This is some good stuff about the job reports. You're going to see the ADP one and the BLS and the revisions. And before I let you guys go, the thing about the revisions on here, this is crazy to me. When you look at how many second jobs people are holding down and how many full-time jobs that we've lost. So you're losing full-time jobs, replacing them with part-time jobs. That's not a healthy economy. That is not the definition of job creation on there. And I think that's really important. You're going to see that in these slides on our YouTube channel at What's Your One More. That's at What's Your One More with the number one. Check us out on our socials at What's Your One More as well. And if you like what you're hearing today, five-star review this podcast, specifically over at Apple and Spotify. We'd greatly appreciate it. But we're on every platform that you catch your podcast on. So please tune in. Until the next episode, we'll catch you at What's Your One More. I got one more shot, I'm gonna make it One more chance, I'm gonna take it I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it I got 